just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. I really love to watch them roll. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. Welcome to Off the Grid with Scantar. I'm going to check a couple of the trade journals. This is an issue. For power engineering. And they're saying the world's first floating wind farm begins operations. Apparently the deeper water has the best breezes. High wind can be used for water depths up to 800 meters, thus opening up areas that so far have been inaccessible for offshore wind. So that, that's a coming thing. This is in Scotland, they're starting that. And th this is very quite interesting to me. This was in an issue of buildings. And we were just on a recent episode talking about generating an electromotive force and we mentioned several one, ones that we didn't uh, mention we didn't mention chemical like a lead acid battery simply going from lead to lead sulfate as it changes chemically and produces an electromotive force well here's something truly new and what they're doing this looks like a tribal tattoo here they're actually printing a solar panel and a battery and uh, with living organisms and such this is fascinating let me just read this right out of here for you harvesting energy from wallpaper paper printed PV panels rely on off-the-shelf technology a new two-in-one solar panel and battery using living cyanobacteria and circuitry printed onto paper in an affordable process discovered by researchers from Imperial College London, the University of Cambridge, and Central St. Martins. Using an off-the-shelf inkjet printer, the team printed electrically conductive carbon nanotubes onto a piece of paper, then printed cyanobacteria photosynthetic microorganisms they can produce small amounts of electricity onto the nanotubes the technology broadly referred to as microbial biophotovoltaics bpv uses cyanobacteria and other algae that convert light into electrical currents with water as a source of electrons Previous BPV projects were expensive to develop, delivered a low power output and didn't last long, but the paper printing process suggests an easier, more affordable way to scale up the technology for potential commercial use. Paper-based BPVs are not meant to replace conventional solar cell technology for large-scale power production, but instead could be used to construct power supplies that are both disposable and biodegradable, explains Dr. Andrea Fanusi, a co-author of the study from Imperial College London. Their low power output means they are more suited to devices and applications that require a small and finite amount of energy, such as environmental sensing and biosensors. But I could see people be getting like tattoos like that to run their uh, smartphone and stuff like that. You wait. We're going to do a shot of, I think this is the best value at the state store. It's very inexpensive. Cruzan aged rum, origin of St. Croix, since 1760. I was born in 1960, so 200 years before I was born, this came along. And we're going to do a shot of this fine rum. And that's just to brace ourselves for what's coming. We'll go right into the scene here. We're going to get 
The Drunken Botanist by Amy Stewart back out. I'm going to hit the books here back in the liquor lab. And I'll just read about, this is in the sugar cane section, which is good to make liquor out of, but there is a dark side. Once it arrived in the new world, sugar cane gave us rum. But it gave us something else too, slavery. Starting in the early 1500s, European trading ships sailed to West Africa and went from there to sugar plantations in the Caribbean, introducing human cargo to their trading partners and opening one of the most monstrous chapters in our history. There was nothing pleasant about work in sugarcane fields. In blistering heat, the canes had to be cut by hand using enormous knives, pressed in powerful mills and boiled in ferociously hot kettles. There were snakes and rodents and vermin of all sorts living in the fields. It was dangerous, exhausting, back-breaking work. The only way to get people to do it was to kidnap them and force them to under penalty of death, which is exactly what happened. Slavery was abhorrent to some Europeans and early Americans. British abolitionists, for instance, refused to take sugar to their tea to protest the way in which it was manufactured, but hardly anyone refused to drink rum. And while we're on the subject of slavery, it's not uniquely an American problem, and I'm, I'm going into this as a time publication about Abraham Lincoln, okay, and we are talking slavery up close. And here's a fact here for you, and it is less than 5% of slaves taken from Africa came to North America. The U.S. outlawed the importation of slaves in 1808. So we got 500,000 slaves in North America, whereas in Brazil it was 4 million. In Spanish Empire, 2.5 million. British West Indies, 2 million. French West Indies, 1.6 million. Danish West Indies, 28,000, just a, a, a pittance there. And in Europe, 200,000, um, practically half of what we had. And it's a monstrous thing. And I would like to quote Mr. Lincoln. And what he had to say was, if slavery isn't wrong, then nothing's wrong. We'll see you next time on Off the Grid with Scandal.